welcome to the Azo Otaku Anime Review. This review is not for normal humans. However, if any of you happen to be aliens, time travelers, or experts, please continue watching. Hey! Hey! It was a joke! Keep watching! Kion is a fairly level-headed high school student. He has never believed in Santa Claus, and even though he was in love with all things fantasy as a little kid, he's grown up and put all that wishful thinking behind him. But just because it's behind him doesn't mean it's going to go away. Enter the unnaturally beautiful, talented, and insanely eccentric Haruhi Suzumiya, who sits directly behind him in class even when he tries to move seats. Haruhi eccentricity number one. A different hairstyle every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. How do he eccentricity number two? Our PE class is separated from the boys and girls. When changing into uniforms, girls use the odd numbered classrooms and boys use the even number. It didn't matter that guys were standing around. She'd just start changing out of her school uniform. To Haruhi, guys were pretty much the same as a bag of potatoes. Kion can't help but be fascinated by this unique specimen he's stuck with, so he starts to pick her brain a little, and over time, she seems to accept him as a friend. Or maybe just a lackey. It happens suddenly. What's wrong with you? I got an idea! About what? I can't believe I didn't realize it before! It's so obvious! What is? If it doesn't exist, I should just make it myself! Make what yourself? Make a club! <laughs> You're gonna help! I feel like I'm being bullied out of my lunch money. Finding herself perpetually bored with reality, Kion and his big mouth give Haruhi the bright idea to start her own school club, focused on discovering supernatural phenomena and other weird stuff. How, she doesn't know, but she figures kidnapping Mikuru to use as a fan service mascot. Where am I? Why did you bring me here? Who are you people anyway? Why are you locking the door? Why pick her of all people then? What are you blind? Just look at her! She's a total little cutie! Great, now she sounds like a pervert. And that's just the beginning! But she's got bigger breasts than me! I mean, look at these things! They're immense! This is another important aspect of Moe. Indeed. Commandeering the reading room as an HQ with a free member inside, the bookish Yuki, and convincing a mysterious transfer student, Itsuki, to join as well, are good steps to staving off boredom with her own incredibly unique club she names... The SOS Brigade! Oh. The spreading excitement all over the world with Haruhi Suzumiya Brigade, the SOS Brigade for short. Yeah, it's okay to laugh now. Kion understandably finds this ludicrous, but all the same, can't seem to tear himself away from Haruhi and her strange little world. And it's no small wonder. The more Haruhi acts like the world revolves around her, the more it almost seems to happen. The motley crew that Haruhi has assembled to entertain her was not brought together out of coincidence, and Kion realizes soon that there is much more to his fickle and melancholic classmate than meets the eye. Right, Kion? On the technical side of things, it's no secret that slice-of-life anime always draw the short straw when it comes to animation budget. We come into those series expecting a lot of talking heads with people frozen in the background, and if things get dramatic, maybe we'll be blessed with looped animations of watery eyes or waving hair before a big dramatic hug, which then freezes again. But no, this is what we want our slice of life to look like. Every little hand gesture, shift in posture, awkward half-blink, everything is animated in Haruhi Suzumiya. Even better, something is always going on in the background, and everything about the show is vibrant and alive. The art is exceedingly moe and over the top, but it really works for this series, seeing as it's somewhat about otaku culture, and there isn't really a need for emotional subtlety that would be steamrolled by those enormous eyes. Nope, this is candy, and that's just what it looks like. Musically, it could probably use a little less sugar, but that just comes with the slice of life territory, too. Kitty J pop, goofy synthesized ditties, the usual, but again, it does fit the series. Vocally, this series is a little bit of a damned if you do and damned if you don't. 
I may be combated on this, but it seems clear to me that Crispin Freeman owns Kion's character much more than Tomokazu Sugita. They're both good, don't get me wrong, but despite the fact he's often referred to as the normal character in the Brigade, I think it's important to keep in mind that Kion is the practical voice of reason, yes, but not a normal, average guy. No. He's a winsome oddball in his own right. He is strange. Supersize me! And while the Japanese sounds tired and snarky enough, Freeman adds an eccentricity and weirdness to his character that just makes him funnier, richer, but most importantly, more understandable in his obsession with this other crazy girl. So, do you change your hairstyle every day to ward off alien invaders? So when did you notice? Ironically, Haruhi has the opposite problem. Both Wendy Lee and Eya Hirano are very good. They both do their best. But something about Eya Hirano's performance makes it unlike anything I've ever heard before. While Wendy Lee sounds much more like a nice, normal person with an attitude sort of attached. Compared to Hirano's genuinely nutso and yet still endearing performance, anyway. Mysterious. Check it out. School started less than two months ago, right? So I'm thinking that anybody who transfers into our school right now has to be mysterious. Right? <laughs> Is Deb Harahi good? Yes, absolutely. Fans who say otherwise are being way too anal. But is she nearly as good as Eya Hirano? Mmm, nope. The rest of the cast sounds great either way, so you can't go wrong with either Dub or Sub, but in terms of the two leads, you'll have to sacrifice one great performance for a good one, whichever track you choose. Now this series is... explosive in every way. What is this? The Camel Cricket. Got it. Thanks, Captain Obvious. It's bizarre, loud, colorful, and its popularity is immense and insane. What's the draw? Well, the premise, the characters, they're every otaku's dream. From the well-loved tropes to the wicked twist behind Haruhi's power over others and Kion's influence on her, it's impossible to describe without spoilers, and I apologize for being so continually vague, but it's safe to say Haruhi's world is maybe what would happen if an anime fan's whims controlled reality, complete with a para para dance routine to send off every episode, and the story is also open to a lot of fan theorizing and speculation, another thing we otaku love to be able to do. Haruhi's otaku-esque obsessions, for example, the desire to be different, the childish escapism blended with adult elements of hyper-violence and sex appeal, and the ability to both draw in and repel outsiders to this wild world of hers, they all make it clear that the creators have tapped directly into the fandom and know just how to celebrate it while never quite calling it out, maintaining an intriguing story. Some call it a satire or a parody, and I think that's giving it too much credit. It's neither deep, nor cynical, nor commentative. As some call it just plain stupid, but that's clearly not true either, for reasons I'll get into in a moment. It's more like a great big party, and all of us nerds are invited. Normal people don't get it, but that's their loss. If they do, well, we've hooked another one, just like Haruhi. Despite being incredibly self-aware and ready to entertain, Haruhi has a host of problems that make it to Moe what Evangelion is to Mecca a real love-hate affair. The story at its heart is brilliant and brimming with possibilities and potential twists, but makes up a surprisingly small chunk of the series. Uh, do you have to hold my hand? Okay, open it. The rest consists of fandom pandering fillers that are a lot of fun, sure, and maybe have some plot element to them, slightly, but mostly pointless and silly amidst a premise that we only want to see developed further instead of skimmed as it is. It's like catching whiffs of an apple pie all day only to run down to the table and see your brother walking off at the last piece, telling you, oh, don't worry, mom will make another one soon. Even if soon is tomorrow, you've wanted that pie all day, and what right did he have to take the last piece when he knew you wanted it? I mean, what kind of a jerk face... Sorry, I got, got a little lost in thought there for a minute. Um, I seem to have lost the point. Haruhi. The characters suffer the exact same problem. Haruhi and Kion are a terrific duo, and gold mines of humor, depth, and originality in their own rights as well. If there's really that many people in the world, then there had to be someone who wasn't ordinary. There had to be someone who was living an interesting life. There just had to be. But 
But why wasn't I that person? More time went by, and before I knew it, I was in high school. I thought that something would change. Obviously, Haruhi's wild, demented ideas drive the story, but the real storyteller is Kyon, who narrates all the madness in a dry, snarky, and completely honest series of ruminations that are never made clear to be just in his head, or spoken out loud, or just somehow known by everyone around him, adding a lot more personality and intrigue to the show. And so, when Haruhi came to class the next day with her long hair all chopped off, I was rather disturbed by it. It's a little rash, don't you think? Not really. And that's it for characters. The other three are cardboard tropes, not just flat, but also lacking in any understandable motivation or even any complex emotions, eternally doomed to one repeated personality trait. Come on, Nagato. No expression, not even a blush. Your face never changes. You can't be serious all the time, can you? I'm not saying they're not likable or that they don't have relevant roles to play, but the series absolutely has to rely on the potential of two characters instead of a dynamic ensemble that could have made this a really terrific series. Instead, it's limited to being a fairly shallow, often overly indulgent otaku party. At the very least, it is about the best party in town. Now, there is a gimmick to the series that you've no doubt been made aware of if you've ever heard of the show. The broadcast order and the chronological order are completely different. The series consists of six plot episodes that come first chronologically, then seven strange and fillerish standalones, and then the meta episode Double Zero that takes place in the middle-ish. On the DVDs, you get the chronological order, and if you watch that way, you get all the plot revelations up front when they occur, and the series will make total sense and be easy to follow. But then you see all the best stuff all at once at the beginning, and you have to end on the worst episode of the series, which is also an open-ended screeching halt. Now, if you shuffle around and watch them in broadcast order, you will be perpetually confused and miss a lot of the fun details, nearly requiring a rewatch. But that's the intended experience, and the end is a lot more unique and fulfilling. Just trust me on this one. If I had to pick a best option between them, I guess I'd go with the broadcast order, but after the series is over, it's no big deal which way you saw it. Either way, you should watch episode Double Zero first, because whether you love it or hate it, it will give you a very good idea of the strange, wonderful, and slightly uncomfortable ride you are about to get on. Hurry! Hey, what's going on? Uh Never mind the teacher that came bursting through the door. The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya is available from Bandai Entertainment. The original novels by Nagaru Tanigawa are available from Yen Press. A manga illustrated by Gaku Tsugano is also available from Yen Press, but as is the usual with such things, it's not really worth a darn. A four-panel style gag manga by Puyo called The Melancholy of Haruhi-chan is also available from Yen Press, though, and if you can believe it, it spawned a web show of the same name by KyoAni, along with a web show spin-off of that called Nyoron Churuyu-san, if you can call that dumb thing a show. A second season was aired in Japan recently, scrambled in with a re-airing of the first, and, well, Google the specifics, but it is one of the most pathetically horrible wastes of money and airtime out there. Much more interesting is the recently released Vanishment of Haruhi Suzumiya movie, and I suspect both the movie and the waste of a second season will be licensed fairly soon, but as of this review, they haven't yet. All in all, Haruhi Suzumiya is above all else unique. It's clear that a lot of love and attention to detail went into the story, and it really speaks to the anime fan and all of us through its twisted premise and fun characters. Still, only two of those characters are more than the flattest of stereotypes, and they and the production values are really the only things that make this show good. After it's over, Haruhi Suzumiya feels more than anything like a big cry of this could have been so much better, but that desire for more isn't really a bad thing either. I give this clever celebration of Otaku Dome three weird wishes come true. Self-proclaimed? Humanoid interface created by aliens. Self-proclaimed? Time-traveling girl. Self-proclaimed? Squad of Esper boys. Out of four. And I sincerely apologize for what you're about to witness. <laughs> You